Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of History Happy Hour. Um, board members for the Rye Historical Society are taking turns reading from the Parsons History of Rye. And um, this week, I will be reading Chapter 7, Schools and Schoolhouses. So first, you do need to make sure that you have the cocktail. Although nobody's even here yet. There we go. Now we have a viewer. <laughs> <coughs> All right. So, schools and schoolhouses. In the act of the provincial council setting off the Sandy Beach district of Newcastle as the parish of Rye in Newcastle, it was provided that the petitioners be empowered to make taxes for the maintaining their minister and poor, as other towns in this province are, and also that the petitioners are obliged to maintain an able orthodox minister of the gospel at their own charges, but that the town of Newcastle be at liberty about a grammar school. From this it is clear that the new parish was to be entirely independent of the parent town so far as the support of the ministry and the poor was concerned, could access and collect its own taxes for those purposes and expend the collections at its own discretion. Newcastle having nothing whatever to say in the premises, but that Rye was to continue to be subject to Newcastle in school affairs as was the case before the new parish was set off. There is nothing in the town records to show how Newcastle exercised the supervisory power over the schools of Rye granted it by the act of separation, or indeed, whether that town ever paid any attention to the matter. But it is doubtful if there was any school organized in Rye until some time after the parish was set off. The first mention in the records of any action taken by the parish toward the establishing of a school is that at a town meeting held March 23, 1729, it was voted that the selectmen be empowered to hire a schoolmaster and move him several times as they see cause for the convenience of the children going to school. And in 731, it was voted that the selectmen be empowered to hire a school teacher one half of a year. In 1737, there was an article in the town meeting warrant to see what you will do concerning a school. But there is no record concerning what action, if any, was taken in regard to this article. In 1739, it was voted that there shall be a moving school and that every party that hath the benefit of a school shall provide a house to keep school in, and that the moving school shall be at discretion of the selectmen of the parish. From 1739 to 1751, appropriations were made annually for a school, and in the latter year there was an article in the town meeting warrant to see if they will do anything concerning building a schoolhouse in the parish, and in 1752 to see if they will vote to build two schoolhouses. The records do not show what action was taken in either year, from which it appears probable that the propositions regarding the building of schoolhouses were negatived years. There was much trouble over the school question. That there was much trouble over the school question is evident, for in 1756 there was an article in the warrant to see if parish will vote the school money shall be divided and let each party hire a schoolmaster according to their liking and in 1757 to see if the parish will settle the school in two places or settle the school the center. First, voted that the school be kept in the center of the parish. Second, voted that the school be kept one half of a year to the eastward of the meeting house. And third, voted that the school be kept in two places above the meeting house. Above the meeting house meant to the westward of it and it is evident that the voters that year were given three propositions to vote on. How the matter was adjusted, the records do not relate. At the March town meeting, 1761, it was voted that the school should be one half above and the other half below the meeting house that year. And in July, 1762, that two schools be kept in the parish each six months the present year. In 1764, there was an article in the warrant to see if they will buy a schoolhouse and lot with a house on it or build a house for the schoolmaster, but there is no record of what action was taken. 
In 1770, there was an article to see if the parish will vote to build a schoolhouse by the meeting house in said parish and vote a school to be kept there. And it was voted there shall be 850 pounds raised for schools, one half for the upper end and the other half for the lower end. At the March meeting in 1774, there was an article in the warrant to see if they will build two schoolhouses and it was voted that the two schoolhouses be repaired. From this, it is evident that between 1764, when the first proposition for building a schoolhouse came before the town meeting in 1774, the parish had become possessed of two schoolhouses, probably through the purchase of buildings previously used for other purposes, for they had been built by the parish subsequently to 1764, they could not have become so dilapidated by 1774 as to need repairing. There is a picture here of the first schoolhouse at Rye Center. I don't know if you'll be able to see it if I hold it up. Oh, there's that. In 1775, there was an article to see if the parish will vote to have two schools for six months in the summer season on which the vote was, there shall be but one school this year. In 1778, there was an article to see if the inhabitants will pass a vote that there shall be a school this year or not, and it was voted that there be no school this year. This action was probably due to the general distress caused by the war with England, then in progress. In 1784, on an article to see if the parish will build a schoolhouse or repair the old ones, it was voted that the selectmen repair the schoolhouses and put them in order, which affords ground for supposing that school matters had practically been neglected from the time the parish had voted in 1778 that a school should not be kept that year. The war being now over, some attention and expenditure to the schools. In 1786, it was voted there shall be a schoolhouse built near where the old one now stands between Mr. Johnson's and Mr. Nathan Knowles, near where the residence of widow Oliver Jennings now is. The cost of this schoolhouse, which was on what is now Grove Road and near Fern Avenue, and was the first schoolhouse of which there is record of its having been built by the town, was 14 pounds, nine uh, S and 60. I know that's pence and something else. But it was not wholly finished at that time, for in April 1789, it was voted that there be winder sheeters at the South Schoolhouse by N. Knowles. And in June following, there was a town meeting called to see that what they will do to finish the schoolhouse by Mr. Nathan Knowles. In 1791, it was voted to build a schoolhouse at the east end of the parish, which was done at an expense of 34 pounds some odd S and D. This schoolhouse was located at Lang's Corner, the crossing of Wallace and Sagamore Roads, near the oak tree in the pasture eastward of Mr. Lang's house. In 1796, it was voted the town shall be divided into two equal parts for to hire schools for each district. 1797, voted the selectmen shall keep 18 months school, the school to begin the 1st of May, at both schoolhouses and keep on five months and shall begin the middle of November and keep on four months. 1798. Voted there shall be 18 months school this year to begin at both schoolhouses the 15th day of April and keep six months and then begin again in December and keep three months. Voted Mr. Porter, Mr. Carroll and Captain Joseph Parsons to be a committee to inspect the schools. 1799, voted to repair the South Schoolhouse, voted to keep 18 months school, same as last year, voted Reverend H. Porter and Joseph Parsons Esquire to be a committee to inspect the schools with the selectmen. There's a picture here of South Schoolhouse. <clears throat> The first record of women being employed as school teachers in Rye was made in 1800 on March 25th, of which year it was voted to keep 18 months school this year and to keep two months at each schoolhouse by women beginning the 1st of May next, and that the men's school shall begin at both houses the 1st of July and keep seven months. 1811, 
voted to keep three months school by women at each end of the town and the time when they shall begin and places where kept shall be left to the selectmen. Ah, repositioning. Okay. So it's a good time to have a sip. It is history happy hour. chose Reverend H. Porter and Dr. Joseph Parsons School Committee, voted to keep nine months at each schoolhouse by men, voted to keep three months at each end of the town by women. The following year, the vote on school matters was the same, excepting that Colonel Thomas Goss, John W. w. Parsons, and Peter Jennis, Esquire, were chosen school committee. 1816 voted that no scholar below the meeting house shall go to the upper school and none above the meeting house shall go to the lower school. In 1826, brick schoolhouses were built in the south and west districts, the south building being very near the highway, east of the present south schoolhouse, and the west building being located on the northerly side of Washington Avenue between Grove and West Roads. In 1827, two more brick schoolhouses were built in the center and east districts at a cost of about $500 each. The center schoolhouse was located on just enough ground for it to stand on in the acute angle formed by the junction of Washington and Wallace Roads and nearly opposite the present Wedgwood School. And the east schoolhouse was built on a small hill about one eighth of a mile to the eastward of the present stone schoolhouse. In March of that year, the old South Schoolhouse was sold to Jonathan Martin for $24.25. And in November, the old East Schoolhouse was sold to Ephraim Seavey for $25. Mr. Martin giving approved notes payable in three months for his purchase and Mr. Seavey notes payable in 30 days for his. Evidently, the amount of ready money in circulation among people of Rye at that date was not very large. 1833. Agreeable to a vote of this town, all persons residing in the same West of Michael B. Goss, Joseph Filbert Jr., and John Jennis Jr., inclusive, including the Abraham Drake House and the Garland Road, will send their children to the West School. Those residing on Mill Road and, and Neck and all South, not included in the West School, will send their children to the South School. All persons residing East of Jeremy Webster's and Nathaniel Berry's will send their children to the East School. In 1845, the town was redistricted and the boundaries of the district defined. And in 1848, the town voted to build six schoolhouses. This was a very large order for schoolhouses for one small town to give, and it was never filled. Probably it was not intended to be by the parties who were instrumental in passing the vote, which may have been done as a grim joke. The East Schoolhouse having been burned a short time before. So here's a picture of the West Schoolhouse. <clears throat> the schoolhouse was rebuilt of brick like its destroyed predecessor, but the other five voted that year still await construction. In 1854, it was voted that the town convey by deed or otherwise to each school district, the schoolhouse located in the same for their specific use. In 1871, the West District erected the present wooden schoolhouse on the southerly side of Washington Avenue, nearly opposite the brick one built in 1826, and near the residence of the late William J. Rand at an expense of $2,000. Mr. Rand gave the land to the district for the sole purpose of a district schoolhouse being erected thereon, the deed of gift providing that if at any time the building shall cease to be used for school purposes for three years in succession, the land shall revert to his heirs. In the South District, a new brick schoolhouse was built in 1881 at an expense of nearly $3,000. It is on Central Road between Cable Road and Love Lane. In the Center District, a new brick schoolhouse was erected in 1893, the district voting to locate the building in the Wedgwood Field, north of the old schoolhouse and on the opposite side of Wallace Road. The owners of the field offered to give a lot in the northeast corner of the field, not to exceed an acre in extent, as a site for the proposed new structure, a consideration in the deed to be that the building should be called the Wedgwood Schoolhouse. 
and at a special meeting of the district, it was unanimously voted to accept the offer. The total cost of the building was $4,172.99. So there is the center schoolhouse. A handsome new schoolhouse was built in the East District in 1896 of Seastone, about one-eighth of a mile westerly from the old one. The district appropriated $4,100 for the new building, and this was its cost to the district, although the actual cost was much greater. The building committee contracted with the late Professor James Parsons to build the schoolhouse for that sum. Professor Parsons subletting the job and making generous disbursements from his own purse. The schoolhouses of Rye are maintained in good condition. None of them are old or of antique pattern, and each is large enough for the needs of the district it accommodates. And the schools will, in qual quality and efficiency, compare not unfavorably with those of other towns in, of the state. The early settlers and those who followed them during the first two centuries of New England's existence, progressive and far-seeing though they were in providing means of education for their children, did not recognize the need or desirability of a schoolhouse having any more land attached to it than it actually occupied. And consequently, cheap though land was in those days, all schoolhouses were built with their front sills flush with the line of the roads that they stood on or very near it. Children were sent to school to study, not to play. And if they wanted to play at recess, they could play in the road. Rye was the same in this respect as other towns, and it was not till towards the middle of the 19th century that the idea of having playgrounds more or less spacious connected with the school buildings began to prevail. And the older residents of the town remember well that when they attended school, they stepped from the road directly into the schoolhouse and from the schoolhouse directly into the road again when the day's studies were over. It is different now, all the present school buildings of the town being provided with good ground room for the scholars to play in. The appropriation of the town for school purposes in 1741 was 20 pounds. In 1744, 25 pounds. 1749, 60 pounds. 1792, 92 pounds. 1795, $177. 1797, $378. And in 1805, $457. The amount gradually increased. And in 1870, and for a number of years following the sum annually appropriated, was $1,200. And in 1900, it was $2,000. During the 18th century, the amount paid for wood to heat the, school, the two schoolhouses ranged from $25 to $43 a year, although wood was then plentiful and very cheap. But when the roughly boarded schoolhouses are considered, and the huge open fireplaces in which the fuel was burned, it does not seem surprising that a large quantity of wood was necessary. In July 1762, Christopher Gould was engaged to teach school for six months, and it is probable that he continued to teach until March 1773, when it was voted the selectmen shall not hire Master Gould. After the latter date, there is no record of other teachers until 1786, when Dr. Joseph Parsons was employed. 1787, Joseph Parsons and Richard Webster. 1788, Peter Mitchell. 1789, Mr. Keyes, or Cones. 1790 to 91, John Carroll. 1793, James Lane. 1794, John L. Piper. Then came in different years, Samuel Willie, John French, Noah Burnham, Mr. Sherburn, John W. Parsons, Richard Webster, Jr., Phoebe Ozel, doing needlework, Nancy Emery and Nancy Hobbs, Joseph Dalton, Joseph Dame, Noah Wigan, Levi Merrill, Thomas J. Parsons, John A. Trefethen, and others of later date. Previous to 1825, Dr. John W. Parsons taught school several terms in the schoolhouse near Lang's Corner, and being the only physician in town, he was frequently called during school hours to attend the sick on which occasions school would be at once dismissed and the children sent home. Frequently after teaching all day, he would make professional calls until a late hour and occasionally would walk over to Northampton to see patients there returning home in the evening on foot. Select or high school. This is a good time for a little drink. 
And hello everybody, We've got Debbie, Donna, nice, thank you guys for joining. Okay, the select or high school, 1840. The vestry in the basement of the Congregational Meeting House having been finished this year, a committee was appointed to procure a sufficient number of scholars to warrant the undertaking of a school, whereupon the committee engaged Mr. Mason H. Morse to take charge of the same the first quarter. But as he could not attend at the time fixed upon for its commencement, Mr. Samuel French opened the school on February 17, 1840 and continued in charge until March 9th, when Mr. Morse ent entered upon his duties. The committee were enabled by the patronage bestowed upon the school to meet their engagements to Mr. Morse and to pay the wardens of the Congregational Society $8.22 for the use of the room. The following, following there are names of the scholars who attended the first term or part of it, and it's the big founding families Foy, Philbrick, Parsons, Jenis, Walker, Green, lots. So buy the book. <laughs> Available in our bookshop, in our gift shop. The second quarter of the select school opened May 25th, 1840 under the care of Mr. Morse, who took the school on his own responsibility. But owing to the busy season of the year, many of the larger scholars were obliged to leave school to assist their parents in farming which so reduced Mr. Morse's income that he was not able to pay the wardens of the Congregational Society anything for the use of the schoolroom. Mr. Morse closed his second term August 15th and soon after left town, leaving none but friends, all being satisfied with his efforts to, to uh, sustain a select school here. I was saying that three times fast. All right, the third term of the select school commenced under the case care of Mr. Simon L. Hobbs, November 3rd, 1840, at $17 a month and board. A few persons who had taken an interest in the school having pledged that pay to him. At the close of the school, it was found that they had not realized sufficient funds to meet the expenses, and the deficiency was made up by Thomas J. Parsons, Richard Foss, John T. Rand, and Jedediah Rand. The fourth term of the school commenced February 8, 1841. As no one felt disposed to pledge the tuition necessary for the fourth term, Mr. Hobbs took the school on his own risk, and having a singing school in the room, they together paid him very well for his services. It was not until 1846 that another attempt was made to establish an advanced school in the town. On April 16th in that year, Nathaniel Watson of Farrington opened such a school on his own responsibility and taught one month, ending with a small number of pupils. In 1847, a term ending May 1st was taught by Daniel Barber on his own responsibility. During the term, he had about 40 different scholars at $1 each. In 1848, a term commencing March 9th was taught by Edwin G. Wallace of Berwick, Maine he having been employed by Thomas J. Parsons at $18 per month and board at $2 per week. The following named pupils were pupils this term. And again, we have lots of Barry's, Caswell's, Drake's, Foss, Parsons, Rand's, etc. In 1851, a term of four weeks was taught by Mr. Rollins of Stratum. He was employed by Thomas J. Parsons and Jonathan T. Walker, who met with no loss. In March 1852, Charles J. Brown commenced a term at his own risk, closing in April. He had about 50 scholars, and this was considered the best and one of the most successful schools ever taught in the vestry. Mr. Brown taught several terms subsequently. Also, Edward Rand of Portsmouth, a Mr. Knoll, and others. Later, the town attempted to establish a high school in the town hall, but it did not prove a success. Now pupils desiring more advanced instruction than the grammar schools of the town afford attend the high school in Portsmouth, the town state law paying the tuition. And then this chapter ends with a list of Rye students who at different times attended Phillips Academy at Exeter. So that is the chapter on schools and schoolhouses. Um, it was a little dry, but um, I thought it would be fun to see 
what schools were like. Um, seeing as right now, kids are home from school and they're being uh, homeschooled or you know trying to learn from home remotely. And uh, I think about all those teachers and all those parents and everybody's just doing the best they can. So it seems like that's really all people ever did was the best they could. So, hey, let's go. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining me for History Happy Hour. And uh, cheers. Have a great evening. Stay safe.